Hi, this is Dan Halsman with VGMAcademy.com, and this is Musicality Now. Hi, my name is Christopher. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and welcome to Musicality Now. Today I'm joined on the show by Dan Halsman, founder of the leading website dedicated to composing music for video games, VGM Academy. Through his free tutorials and resources, expert interviews, and courses and workshops for his members, Dan is helping aspiring composers from around the world to discover what's unique about video game music. From the musical side of things, through to the technological specifics, through to career and marketing advice for breaking into the video game industry. As someone who grew up playing a lot of video games myself, and listening to their soundtracks probably more than any other genre of music for several years, I was really excited to have the chance to chat with Dan about what goes into composing music for games. In this conversation, Dan shares the one thing which more than anything else is distinctive about video game music, which is still the case now, decades after the first game soundtracks were written. We talk about the surprising reason it can sometimes actually be very hard to produce an album version of a game's soundtrack these days. And Dan reveals the clever way that his high school choir director tricked him into joining the choir, which set Dan on the path to a career in music teaching and founding VGM Academy years later. I know that for some in our audience, the phrase video game music will conjure up memories of very simplistic music barely worthy of consideration, while for others, like myself, it represents a large and serious part of our love of music. I hope this conversation will be enlightening for you, whether you find yourself in one or the other category, or somewhere in between. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is Musicality Now from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Christopher. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to chat today. I was saying to you before we hit record that I've been admiring your work from afar for so long. I think I stumbled a upon your site with a music theory guide to Final Fantasy VII, which was, you couldn't ask for something better suited to the nerd inside me, just like music theory plus Final Fantasy VII. I was an instant convert and I've been a fan ever since. Awesome. <laughs> so I, I've been super keen to have the chance to talk and particularly about your work at VGM Academy and how you're now helping other people learn video game music composing in particular. And I wonder if we could take things right back to the beginning though and tell a bit of your story and where you've come from as a musician. So, uh, you know, do what, do you want to, uh, I could give you a, a synopsis here. So I was like, I got into music really late, actually. Um, I was interested in video game music pretty early and I just like sort of had like that ear of the bug for it. Um, but I didn't do anything musical until I was in high school, really. Um, and I got, I, uh, got really hooked on, there was a, a song Crush by Dave Matthews Band that I heard on the radio. And that sort of like just blew my mind open to the world of music in general. It's just, it's just very different from what I was hearing on the radio. Something about it was really appealing to me. Um, and I got really hooked on that band. And then from there, I started like playing air guitar in front of the mirror way more than anyone would care to admit. And after about a year of that, I decided to put, you know, try to do a real guitar. And I borrowed a uh, you know, a junker from a friend of mine and, and played for, taught myself for a year. And then I got tricked into joining the choir and had a really inspiring music teacher. And, and uh, you know, he, he inspired me to become a music teacher myself. And that was a kind of a long, hard road, but because I got, got, got in so late to music, but it's, it's been a wild ride. How did the guitar learning go for you? You clearly were picking it up because you were internally motivated you had this passion for it and this idea that you could presumably be a rock god what what did it look like to learn at that time ah so i was lucky that because you know the internet existed at the time um i could look up guitar tabs so i didn't have to be able to read music i could just use my ear and the numbers to know which fret i had to play uh frets i had to play to learn all the chords and stuff like that um but i picked a very unique person to kind of emulate because the way that Dave Matthews writes and plays, he doesn't use a lot of open chords, which are like the easier chords to play on the guitar. He use, uses a lot of closed voicing. He uses a lot of rhythmic licks that are repetitive and loop a lot. Um, and, you know, it, it, on the one hand, it was sort of hard mode, but I didn't really realize it in a way, like starting out with that stuff. But on the other hand, once I could really do 
Uh, I was not satisfied with like playing something and not having it sound exactly like it did when he played it. So I got as close as I could. Uh, but with that, that insistence to play these things that, you know, people really probably shouldn't be starting with, uh, I developed some skills that really helped me learn so, you know, more songs quicker and quicker. So there's like a song, for example, called Satellite, which is just a really pet repetitive um, lick that just goes over and over again. But your, your hand is like constantly moving all over the place, up and down on the, the fretboard and, you know, while you're singing. And I just insisted I had to know how to do that. So I did it. Um, and in doing that, I learned how to, you know, do a decent job of finger picking and muting strings. So like, I just inadvertently had to learn these other skills I didn't even realize I was doing in order to make it sound the way I wanted it to sound. So it was, it went a lot better than it probably could have. Um, and, and, uh, I haven't st stopped since it's been a lot of fun. And you mentioned an inspiring teacher there. What did they do that was inspiring or what was it about them that makes you now a couple of decades, I guess, later? remember them and give them credit for steering you in this direction? Yes, Dr. Joe Hawking. Uh, he was a, first of all, he tricked me into joining the choir, which, <laughs> which immediately earned my respect um, because of the way he did that. And then, and I'll tell you about that in a second if you'd like, but um, he, just in terms of his teaching, he was, he was an excellent teacher and musician. He got really great results out of his choir. He um, was very likable. Uh, but he had really high standards and that sort of combination of likable, but having really high standards um, was sort of what really drove me and propelled me from, you know, walking in at 15, not knowing how to read a single note, even though I was playing guitar, I did not read sheet music at all. Um, not knowing how to read any notes and never having sung before really in my life, other than, you know, whatever I was doing and, you know, if I was walking around singing in the shower, I don't even remember singing really beyond that. Um, and taking me from that to a point where I was, you know, getting, you know, a lead in the musical my senior year and almost making it into all state choir. And, you know, ultimately after a couple years of additional work in college, finally getting into the music major so I could pursue that path of music educator. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't had that accelerated, you know, experience, but also if I hadn't had someone who really tried to um, improve me and like really pump me up and show me that I could do it, even though I was starting so late, it was really big about the, the work and the effort versus the natural talent thing, which is also something I'm very passionate about, sort of focusing on your effort and your, your ability to focus on what you're good at versus, you know, using talent as either a you know an excuse or using talent as an out or using talent as you know a reason to sit back on your laurels and and not go as far as you could and was he taking this kind of encouraging attitude to everyone and that was just his way or did you have a special relationship he took an interest in you in particular or um, yeah, I, I think he, I think he did, you know, I, I think he and I, cause you know, I was one of the few guys, you know, cause there was, there's was that, but I think he and I did have a, a bit of a special relationship, but he really did take that approach with his choirs. You know, I felt that I, I, you know, first felt that from him in a group setting, you know, and, and that was a really, you know, really nice thing to have someone just speak, not just about like what we were doing technically, but what we were doing and the emotional impact of what we were doing. And, you know, that's, you don't get those experiences unless you go out of your way um, in the academic setting at that age. You know, you have to be in a choir for someone to be talking about feelings and intent and something that happened 300 years ago that this composer wrote about that is relatable to you as a 15 year old, your sophomore year trying to, you know, get your first girlfriend, you know, that, so there's like things that there's connections that you won't, you know, you won't have unless you go out of your way to have those experiences or someone, like I said, tricks you into, uh, into having those experiences. So you have to share how he tricked you. Yeah. So, um, I has, I, I had just actually started. So I had this girl that, that uh, I liked and she liked me and we were in that like weird phase of, we were like pretty much dating, but we hadn't, out loud said that we're boyfriend and girlfriend. We were just sort of in that like weird in between where we hadn't said it officially, um, but we, we were. 
And I think we were like, we were at backstage at a, a concert or an assembly or something where we were backstage in a hallway and we were like holding hands for the first time or something. It was very, very new. So we were both still like in that, like, you know, beaming, like all smiles, also really uncomfortable, you know, teenage love stage. And the, he walks by and he just stops on a dime and pivots and turns around and walks back to us because she was in the choir. So he had known her for a couple of years at this point. And he came up to me and he said, are you two dating? And we were like, uh, yes. And he said, and he said, because you can't date a girl in the choir unless you're in the choir. And I was just so uncomfortable that I was just like, okay. And he's like, so come by my office tomorrow at two 30 <laughs> after school and we'll talk about joining the choir. And I was like, all right. And then he just left and that was super uncomfortable. But then I went to this meeting the next day and he, you know, he had, we talked for 15 minutes or so. And when I left his office, I left his office feeling like, you know, I totally had this in me and I totally could sing and I had the ability and I'm like, you know, kind of feeling good about having joined the choir. And then I noticed that he had never actually heard me sing. We just talked. And I was like, that guy played me. And he played me really well. I respect that. I'm going to give this a try. That was awesome. So, you know, that's how I ended up in the choir. And, and uh, I guess the rest is history. That's tremendous. I love that. And it, it sounds like you were conscious around that time that you had started late. You maybe had peers who had started at a younger age. How did that go from that point on for you? It sounds like you made a lot of progress in that first year of choir. Were you able to kind of shake off that um, discomfort of having started late? Or what was that trajectory like? Yeah, that's that actually really sucked for a long time. So I probably didn't get over that until probably until, until I was a student teaching the last year of college. And I think that because when I got into the choir, you know, first of all, everyone was just super excited to have another guy in. A lot of the, the you know, the, the people in the choir I was friends with. Um, so they were excited to have me there, which so that was kind of nice. Um, and then we would sort of do the music theory, you know, separately. Like we do like 20 minutes of music theory, you know, a couple of times a week. Because this is like an everyday choir that I joined. And then um, I would be learning by ear most of the time. So I'd be sitting next to someone who could sing it and learn it. And I would learn it by ear sitting next to them. Um, and then it wasn't until like my senior year where, you know, we were all doing these like self-paced music theory books, but I didn't realize that I had gone so far in the music theory that I had surpassed many of the other people because everyone was at like working at different levels and graded at whatever level they were at. Um, but it wasn't until senior year where he had, you know, my, my uh, choir teacher told me that I had been, you know, I was past several of the people in, in the group who was, who were, I thought were, you know, way beyond me with the music theory stuff. Um, but even with that, you know, I, I had, you know, learned guitar, but I hadn't learned to read music. So I joined, I ended up getting pulled into the jazz band for a little bit for, I think a year and cause they needed a guitar player. And I was really the only one in the school that they knew of but I couldn't read any of the music. So that was a real struggle. And I remember like a couple of, you know, jerk kids making fun of me for it and giving me a hard time about not being able to keep up because I, I couldn't. But um, so I had to spend, I had to literally spend time, you know, with the the lead sheets saying, like, All right, what is this crazy D with a triangle and a set, you know, and I had to like go and look it up online. And, you know, half of the time I couldn't find fingerings that I could actually do quickly. So I had to like figure out different ways to play everything. And it was really tough. And, you know, I finally, when I finally like could sort of play songs that felt really good, but even, in, even in college, you know, I, because my reading was weak and my sight singing was so weak, I couldn't get into the major and I actually wasn't even allowed to take guitar lessons as a guitar minor um, for jazz because I couldn't read music. Um, so I thought it was a little interesting that I couldn't learn to, you know, do music because I wasn't good enough at music. I thought that was a really weird um, irony. Uh, and, and it wasn't until maybe a couple of years in, I was a voice, um, I did a voice minor, because I could get into that. And then after two years, I finally was able to audition and get into the music major. So kind of reset the clock uh, a lot of ways with the university stuff. So I was in college for six years instead of four. 
but um you know throughout the major too it was tough it was it, everyone was sharper on their their technical skills than me and you know it was not something that was unnoticed by professors and they were not super compassionate about you know they didn't, they didn't know and they didn't care where you know how late in life you started they just knew where you came in at and where you needed to be in order to pass the class and so it was tough it was tough for a long time and it wasn't until probably I started teaching where I found my strengths more as a teacher than as a performer that I really started to feel more comfortable in my skin and realized that, okay, I'm really good at this. I see my peers now struggling with this thing that I feel more naturally good at. So everyone's good at stuff and everyone's bad at other stuff and that's fine. And along the way, were you, were you ever considering not continuing with music? You know, it sounds like you were given plenty of reasons to think maybe I'll go do physics instead or whatever else might have caught your fancy, but clearly you persisted to your credit. Yeah, well, I had to, you know, initially pick other paths because I wasn't being allowed in. So for two years there, there was no guarantee I was being allowed in and I had to be, you know, a little practical. Um, I would say not very practical, but I had to be a little practical in that like, I needed to have a focus because I was in college and you need to have some sort of focus. So, you know, I came in as an art major for a little bit and I quickly realized that I just, that was just not for me. And so I dropped that and I ended up doing physics for a little while, actually. I, I, uh, cause I had a, a really fun physics experience in high school and, and I ended up doing physics cause I enjoyed physics, uh, for a semester or two and until the calculus got so convoluted that I really just didn't feel the need to go any further. Um, but yeah, I, I did have to sort of entertain that. And I really didn't know which way to go because that, that music teacher path, for so long had been the path I wanted to do. So I did, but um, you know, it was also still in the back of my mind that I wanted to try to do this and I wanted to try to do this. And once I was in, it was, I needed to work to stay in because you know, halfway through they had the option of kicking you out. So, you know, yeah, I had to be practical, but I also did, did, I was pretty, I guess, pretty tenacious as well. It sounds like it. And I think you mentioned there that video game music caught your ear fairly early on. Through this story, was there part of your brain saying, I'm going to compose for video games one day, or I'm going to run the top membership site for teaching other people to compose for video games? Or no. was that just, uh, you know, <laughs> at the early gestation phase? No, you know, I always was interested in writing music once I started getting into music as, again, you know, a 15 year old. Um, but I did start noticing how good the music was when I was in, I can remember as early as, you know, being in third grade, my mother hired a guy to come to my house and teach piano lessons to my sisters and I. And I remember he would give us this, you know, that only lasted for maybe a couple of months before none of us wanted to continue with it. But he would come over and he would say, you know, okay, did you do the homework? And I'd say, no, but, and I would turn the TV on and I'd have, you know, play it up in this game until this certain point where this song was playing and I, you know, I'd have it paused with the TV off and I'd say, but do you hear this music going on in the background? I would really like to learn to play this. Can you teach me this? So it just kind of came to a point where it's like, he was like, you're not going to do my homework, are you? You're just going to try to learn these video game songs. And I was like, yes, yes, I, I am. I'm sorry that I'm not sorry, but that's really what I'm interested in. And, you know, back then it felt more like playing. I was just playing around. Um, but in college, I wanted to sort of explore the idea of writing for games, but there just was not really any, you know, resources out there yet. Internet so sort of was barely hitting maturity, and um, I, I couldn't find, you know, there was a couple of books, but they were more about, like, the historical, you know, recollection of how, the early composers had to do it from a technical perspective, which was not helpful if you wanted to start, you know, at the current time. Uh, I tried to start a few times myself uh, and just really just went in the absolute wrong directions. I remember the first time I was like, I'm going to try to write something for a video game. I fired up Sibelius and pulled the full orchestra score up. And, you know, granted, I was a couple years into my music major probably at that point, but I had no, I had no excuse for pulling up an entire orchestra score. That was just, that was like trying to go into a professional cook's kitchen to make an omelet for the first time. It's just not, it, it was just overwhelming and it went very terribly. And, and, uh, you know, I, but I didn't have anyone to tell me otherwise. I didn't have books that I, you know, had found that, 
could speak to what I was trying to do because, you know, a lot of the resources are, were about classical composition, even film music uh, composition wasn't, you know, you know, kind of taboo back then. And, and uh, you know, no one in the, the university would teach me composition either for the same reasons of like, you know, you're supposed to be doing this other thing. And what have you composed before? You haven't composed anything before. Well, then we can't teach you how to compose. So it's very sort of a weird, again, a weird irony of I don't know enough to learn how to do something. Gotcha. And I, I'm conscious that although I may be deeply nerdy about video game music, a lot of people in our audience, they might be similarly totally au fait with the state of the art in what video game music is. They might have not heard or even thought about video game music since Mario Brothers in the 80s. They might have literally never heard video game music, I imagine. And I'd love if we could just paint a bit of a picture. If we cast back to when you were <laughs> causing your piano teacher so much trouble, what kind of music were you playing for him? What you, you said you were aware early on of how good it was. What was it that made it good to you at that stage? And what kind of music was it? It was the melodies, you know, I, to, to think about all the tunes, you know, video game music or otherwise that have stayed and have been popular. It's always, you know, it's always to me about the melody. Um, Mega Man X, uh, was the series I was really into at the time when I was harassing my music teacher um, in third grade because uh, those had really cool electronic, you know, inspired electric guitar imitating because it was, you know, you couldn't record, like you couldn't record music and put it into a Super Nintendo back then. It just, the memory of the game would, could not hold it. There was such a limited space that you could use to save the data for the music that you had imitations of instruments called MIDI. Um, and uh, you just could, you know, it, those melodies for me, I could still recall them and they're still some of the best melodies I could think of, um, you know, and that's why, you know, you could go around the world and musicians, non-musicians, you know, gamers, non-gamers could probably hum the Super Mario Brothers theme song because it's just so pervasive because the melody was very well written and it had a huge impact. So for me, it's all about, it's all about the melodies and, and um, you know, I just happened to find that there are a lot of really great melodies. You you know, before we hit record, you'd mentioned the Final Fantasy VII music theory article that I wrote. And that whole series of Final Fantasy has some of the best melodies in video games. Nobu Mamatsu, the Japanese composer, you know, he learned, he taught himself. He was really big into like, you know, Elton John, which is obviously, a, he's, a, he's a great writer of melodies. And, you know, he's really into prog rock. And so he like could really write some cool chord progressions that were not super American. So there's just these really cool things that end up in video game music that ended up resonating with me. But if I had to really pick one thing, it's really good melodies. And that was true back then. Would you say it's still the defining characteristic now? Um, no, I mean, I'd say I, I just recently interviewed a composer, Grant Kirkhope, who wrote for a bunch of uh, video games uh, and also some of the video games I played growing up on Nintendo 64. And he actually put it in a way that I really appreciate. He said that he, feel, he felt like video games were in some ways sort of like a last bastion of melodic music um, because you know if you think about film music you know superhero movies are always like a good one to you know easy one for people to sort of relate to a pick on so you can you know you can you know maybe hum the super mario brothers theme song but i really encourage you to sing back to me any of the tunes from any of the iron man movies you know great music but I can't rem remember much of it, you know, from a, a melodic standpoint, I, I couldn't hum that for someone and have them recognize it. The only real tune from like all those Marvel movies, which are so successful is like, you know, the Avengers theme and to have, you know, 20, 30 movies that have such critical success, but you only have one, one melody that's really memorable. That's kind of crazy. You know, not I'm not judging good or bad. It's just kind of for me, kind of almost impressive that that happened. Um, so I think that right now, video games is sort of where melody is at. But I do notice more of a focus, especially with Americans, um, on production and technology and the way that kind of communicates to the music is you have much less of a focus on melody and much more of a focus on the mood, the ambience, you know, the, the textures, things like that. 
Um, but I think that's also, it's a question of like, there's not really a lot of good resources out there for learning melody because it's sort of seen as this mystical, you know, either you have it or you don't skill of writing melodies or, you know, inspiration has got to hit you. Hopefully you've got the notebook nearby next to your bed when you wake up in the middle of the night with that epiphany or you jump out of the shower or run across the room with your towel to jot it down before it's lost forever. Like that, I think is still a thing for people. Um, and so I think it's sort of that dichotomy of this over-focus on technology plus this lack of resources for melodic writing um, that makes it, you know, I've seen the focus decrease on melody, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's tough because it's like a double-edged sword. It's, it's really great. The technology stuff is really great because now everyone has access, which is awesome. Now a kid with a laptop can become a, you know, a, a successful composer, you know, and make a living writing music, which is amazing. You know, to, to say that that could have happened 20 years ago, it, it just couldn't have happened. Um, you know, using free software, nonetheless, or very cheap software. But, uh, you know, the, the switch, you know, the, the other edge of the sword there is that you've got people who really can get into part of the music, but they, they don't have direction or access to some of the other parts. If you want to learn to write and you don't have any classical training, that can be a tough obstacle for a lot of people. It's not a roadblock necessarily, but that can be a tough challenge for uh, people to navigate because then it limits your ability to write music that has, you know, a lot of variety and things like that. If you don't understand sort of like the language. Um, so, you know, it's, I think that the melody writing is definitely still really big in video game music. And I noticed that the music that's really popular in gaming and gets the awards and that kind of stuff is usually very melodic music, but there's more and more music that's not necessarily melodic that is, you know, is there and it's, and it exists and it's being created more and more. And that's great because people who can write that stuff really well can make a living doing that and there's a place for it. So. That's super interesting. So I, I want to come back in a minute and talk about what it is, if not a flash of inspiration in the middle of the night that lets you write a good melody. But first, maybe we could just talk a little bit more about the specificities of video game music composing, because I think I'm very aware that, you know, when you and I were growing up, it, it had a very certain sound to it, you know, the 8-bit, even 16-bit sound palette. It sounded like bleep, bloop, bloop, blap, blap. And it was incredible music, but you'd have to love video games to listen to it, right? And in this day and age, as you say, you know, there are kids kicking up a full orchestral score in Sibelius and fleshing that out, and it sounds like a real orchestra to a large extent. And I think a, the majority of games, it's fair to say, these days would have that kind of full fidelity instrument sound, you know, whatever ensemble it might be, but seriously good sounding music. What constraints are left if it's not the if it's not the timbre and the instrumentation that defines video game music? Is there anything apart from the literal fact that it is in a video game? Mm -hmm. I'd say the lack of constraints is sometimes the challenge because of, like I said, you know, that access, but also, you know, there's just so many choices now. It can be paralyzing. Whereas back then you only had, you know, Hey, we can only stretch a square wave so far. So we have to program, you know, it's really based on our programming ability plus our musical ability. And now it's, you know, if I were to start today, there are thousands of sound libraries, which you, you, you know, buy or download and install, and it plugs those sounds into your program so you can use them in your compositions. Um, and there's just so many choices that it can be paralyzing to someone who's new. Uh, and I think from a technical standpoint, that's one of the biggest challenges. So that lack of limitations, because you have to sort of self-impose limitations, um, which you know, is, is fun to do. And, and, you know, I do that with like, I have these like composition quest logs, which are like video game themed lists of writing prompts uh, that I have on my website. And it sort of imposes some of those constraints um, in, in some ways. But the, you know, from a technical standpoint, I mean, you know, it, it, Candy Crush Saga, a really popular video game on the iPhone, the, on, on mobile devices, on Facebook, that was recorded, you know, by the London Symphony Orchestra. So, you know, I mean, I don't think there's limitations really, but I think there are some technical 
challenges. For example, there's a bit of a movement now towards um, towards music that is responsive to what's happening in the game on a much deeper level than maybe before. So, you know, and when we were growing up, it was, you're in a battle, here's the battle music. You're out of the battle, here's the town music for whatever town you're in. And that's great and that's very pleasant and that still exists today. But now there's also this need for, you know, adaptive music where, you know, you have a character and, you know, depending on the choices that you and that character make, it changes the music, you know, depending on which, uh, which direction you go in this level, new instruments are either introduced or removed from the composition. So you've got this like multi-layered composition and you have all these pieces that have to be able to fit together, but you may not be always hearing them or ever hearing them depending on the choices you make as a player. So from a technical standpoint, that can be a little bit more complex to conceive all of those parts and figure out a sort of a cohesive way where all those work together. And then next to that, you've got now these middleware programs, which are basically ways to tell the video game to, you know, take your, your music assets and translate them based on, you know, the actions that a player takes so that if they decide to go uphill here, the music gets, you know, the tempo gets faster. And if they decide to go downhill here, the music gets darker. And, you know, so it's, 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 can be more complicated um, from a technical standpoint to get your music into a game because, now there are again more choices and more abilities but there's this sort of unique experience because it's an interactive format where now the music can be interactive too if you want to take it there whereas if, with a film you watch the movie and the music complements the movie and elevates the movie and but the movie is static once it's done you know once the movie's done that's the movie and a video game you can make different choices you can play it differently each time you can you know sometimes start over and you know with a brand new character and play a completely different story than the first time you played so there's a lot more options now um, and then from a technical standpoint the technology had to sort of rise to meet that that ability of uh, making more you know choices as a player and how that could translate to the experience with the music that's fa fascinating i think I've, I've only played a handful of games where the music is adaptive in that way and not in any sophisticated kind of degree but to hear you describe it there, it kind of sounds like a new art form almost, you know, I don't want to be too ostentatious here, but the fact that someone has to compose music in such a way that it can be reassembled on the fly to match something else that's going on, that that's really interesting. Yeah, so to give you now, to give you a perspective on how that sort of can be a bad thing on the tail end, for, well, maybe not a bad thing, but a different thing. So uh, first person that comes to mind, Austin Wintry, another great composer. He was the first video game composer to be nominated for a Grammy. And he is about our age too, which is also crazy. Um, and he wrote this soundtrack for this game called Journey. And it's a beautiful soundtrack. I don't Have you ever heard it? It's a beautiful soundtrack. It's got it's it's very centered on the cello, and the cello player is fantastic, and the music is amazing. Um, but here's the thing: he wrote it to be a completely adaptive score, and he did that, and that was always his intention, and it was always the developer's intention, and it went beautifully. And then they wanted to release it as an album. Now the trick there is that it never existed from like a point A to point B. Here's where the music starts. Here's where the music ends. You know and here's how it sounds between point A and point B, like that was never the same ever in the game. So he and his team had to literally go through all of the music and rearrange it to be released in a cohesive soundtrack. In, and that is kind of an interesting thing because you, you know, you'd think like the track is done, we drop it in the media, but it was like the track was never a track really. It was just a, an amalgamation of all these musical elements that were weaved together. But now we have to, arrange it into a, a digestible, you know, track for release on iTunes. So it was kind of a different angle. It's very interesting to hear about that challenge uh, from him, but that's sort of like the, the, the other side of the, the interactive media that, you know, because it can be, it can live in such a different way. Um, you know, you, it's really harder to kind of nail down what a piece is within some of these video games. I think they just did a, or they're doing soon, a live concert for a game called I think I think it's Undertale, and they were going to attempt and I didn't read how it went, but they were going to attempt to 
play the game live and have the orchestra react to the choices in the game, you know, within reasonable limits and try to have sort of that, that live concert plus the interactive elements, which I'm sure is going to be really stressful. Um, but it's also a really kind of interesting idea to try to pull off. So it is. And, uh, you know, in some ways it, it's not a new concept. If you think of the pianists who used to accompany silent movies or there are improv comedy troops who kind of make up operettas on the fly and that kind of thing. But the combination of pre-composing and connecting it with computer logic that's going to rearrange things and having it all adapt to what the player is doing, I just think is, is super cool. And you highlighted melody as maybe the common strand that's run through all that and characterizes video game music as being distinctive or unique. And you, you kind of said in a tongue-in-cheek way, it's not a, a flash of divine inspiration. You've had the chance to study some of the greats in video game music and interview some of the top names today. What have you learned from talking to them and from your own experience about what it is if it's not a flash of divine inspiration that makes for that great melody? I think it's work, you know? I think that... Well, that doesn't sound fun, Dan. <laughs> well, I think it, you know, it. well, if you enjoy it, you know, cooking is work, but if you enjoy cooking, it's 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 fun work. Um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, people think that it's a process that happens magically or organically, um, and that might seem to be true in some instances. I could sit down and I could bang out a melody that would sound decent right now within a minute, but, you know, or, you know, a short one anyways, but, you know, the, what's happening there is a lot of things. You know, one thing is that I've done it a bunch of times. So, and I've also like studied literally how, how to do it and sort of figured out for myself what I think works. But, um, you know, there's a lot of processes going on under the hood, just like, you know, to kind of use the, the, the cooking analogy again, you know, there's, when you see someone professionally cooking, it looks like everything is easy for them because they, but it's not because it's easy for them. It's because they've done it and they've internalized a lot of what they're doing over a long period of time. And melody writing's the same way. It's something you have to learn and you have to practice and you have to sort of analyze what you're doing and figure out how to do it differently and in a way that you enjoy and and um, it's work, you know, you take a little idea and you develop it into a bigger idea and you develop that into a bigger piece. And, uh, you know, there, there are steps you could take to do that. Um, but if you perceive it as this process of either I have that talent or I don't, then you, you can't walk down those steps. You don't, you know, look for those steps because you don't know that they exist. You know, I could take, you know, I've, I've literally to prove this to people, I've, I've gone on Twitter and I've said like, give me four, you know, give me a random letter and between A and G and people have spit out, you know, and I, I'll take the first eight letters and I will use those as like, you know, my starting points for a melody and I'll just build a melody from those things. And it's not because I'm magical, but it's because I know some tricks and rules. I'm not a specifically talented, you know, melody writer, but I understand, okay, if you've got the, you know, I know that, you know, generally speaking, if you're in the key of C, you want to start on a C and end on a C, and that's kind of how it's going to sound done. And generally speaking, if things, if you, you know, rhythmically, you've got a lot of complicated rhythms, it's going to be hard for people to remember and, and sing it because it's just really busy sounding. And, you know, it, it's, there's all these little rules and tricks and all these ways to find balance. And, you know, that's sort of the, the thing I want to push that, like, you can learn this. There are, you know, there aren't a whole lot of resources out there to do it. But that's, you know, what people are doing when they magically write a melody. It's not that they're just pour, it's just not just being channeled and pouring through them from, you know, this divine force of music that has chosen this person over that person. It's that they have done it enough times that it, a lot of the things that might be slow for you are natural and quick for them. Just like reading music. I felt like I was, you know, reading Japanese as a 15 year old in the choir next to the people who were able to to read it because they've been doing it since sixth grade or since you know younger than that you know say i still feel the same way with a piano like when i want to learn a piece of, on the piano it's a slow process i can read the notes but you know it's a slow process all those notes at the same time for me but for someone who's been doing it since they were in third grade you know they can do it instantly and that to me feels and looks magical but it, you know in reality it's practice and it's patterns and it's 
you know, a step-by-step -step thing that they did and they just, they don't have to slow down to do each step like I have to do. And I think these days when, as you pointed out, you know, any teenager can fire up Fruity Loop Studio or Muse Score and have a go at composing, there's a lot of, not controversy, but there's a lot of mixed opinions about the importance of music theory and the kind of classical approach to music education. How do you think about the relationship between theory and composing? I think it's a useful tool. I think it's a lot of useful tools and tricks and it's a language. And if you understand the language, then you can do more with it. You can have more sophisticated conversations if you want to like keep, you know, the language analogy going. Um, you know, it's, it, it's also something that some people can, you know, into it that they, they don't need to be, they don't need to articulate what they're doing. You know, there is some natural talent, you know, at play at times, you know, there are people with a natural ear who can hear a complicated cluster of notes and they know all the pitches or they can, you know, eat more easily at my roommate in college, he could recognize the, the chord progression by ear really easily. And I had to go over and like pluck away at the piano to figure out what was going on. Um, so there's a little bit of natural, you know, talent at play, but not as much as, as people think. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent, but um, you know, I think that music theory is super useful and I think that it's also super complicated and it can feel overwhelming. And I think that you need to learn it within a context that's enjoyable for you. Otherwise you're not going to remember any of it because it's complicated. It's a lot of details. You know, I, I'm not going to remember, you know, I don't remember anything from the harmony classes that I did in college just where, you know, when I didn't enjoy the music that we were learning about, you know, Bach fugues, you know, if you love those, awesome. I personally, you know, there was some Bach music that I really liked, but I personally have a really hard time, first of all, remembering the names of all the classical stuff because it's all so similar and, and uh, the instrumentation, you know, of Baroque music is all, you know, very similar. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing where I was not being taught it within the context of something that interests me. So I'm getting this really detailed information at the same time as I'm like getting it through a lens of something that I don't really like. So I couldn't remember it. Um, so now if I want to, you know, do a trick that I, you know, if I want to do something different, I have to look it up and reteach myself or something like that. Um, so I think it's really useful. Um, but I think it, it really kind of falls on deaf ears if you don't learn it within a context that matters to you. I know, you know, I made connections with the guitar stuff because I learned the music theory way later after the, you know, I've been playing the guitar for years, but you know, I didn't think, Oh, Hey, you're right. You know, every time I, you know, do a, you know, do a song that starts on G, I end up always using these same chords. Okay. Now I kind of get why it's always those chords in these songs. And when there's one of those chords that isn't one of the, you know, the chords I usually play in a song that starts on a G chord, it sounds kind of out of place or unique or interesting. So, you know, I think that, that um, music theory is super important, but only within the context of what's interesting to you. If you just go out there with like, you know, the, the, uh, the, the shame feeling of I should know music theory, I need to know it, otherwise I can't do what I want to do, you know, that's not going to get you very far. But if you really look at some of the music that you enjoy and you pick it apart to see what is it that you like about it and why it works for you, that to me is far more interesting you know to take it back to Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo you know there's this one level the spark manager level in Mega Man X1 it has one of the best electric guitar solos and I have to put that in quotes because it's not really an electric guitar it's someone programming as close as possible to what it you know the sound of an electric guitar that they could make at the time but for me that taught me more about melody than you know most of my college stuff because that was such an interesting melody to me. But then I looked at why it was interesting. It wasn't because that melody was better than the stuff I was doing in college. It's because it, it motivated me to look at what was working and what wasn't in there. Awesome. And I feel like we've kind of cheated the listener out of the middle part of your story a little bit. <laughs> when we left off, we were you, were you were gearing up for a career teaching music, which is still your primary job, teaching elementary music, I believe. But obviously, we've also alluded to VGM Academy, where you teach the specifics of video game composing and also some of the career and marketing side of that. 
How did those two worlds come together? Where did video game music become more of just your childhood interest? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, like I said, I, I wanted to try video game composing in college and there just wasn't any resources for me. And I ultimately just got frustrated with that. I ended up looking back into it after college and I was like, "You are you kidding me? There's still really nothing out there? This is ridiculous. And at the same time, I was really getting into um, online business and marketing uh, through a book I, I uh, listened to called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And it just it was a really interesting book about, you know, starting business, starting a business and, you know, sort of flipping how people think about how they live their lives from like a financial and uh, you know, logistical standpoint. And that opened me up to marketing and marketing podcasts. And, and uh, you know, I got really into business at the same time as I went back into this and I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's nothing. So I forget it. I'll just build one. So I ended up sort of combining two interests of online business and, you know, this video game music. And I was, you know, still a teacher at heart, even though I wasn't working as a teacher at the time. Um, and I went into, I started this website and then I, I looked actually earlier, uh, cause I just want to make sure I remembered. I started the website. I launched it originally, uh, in 2014. Um, so it's, it's not super old, but it's not super young from a website perspective. So it started as basically a blog, uh, with an, you know, with a, an email newsletter. And from there it's, it's grown. It's now, you know, I've got a membership site uh, for people who want to go a little deeper and get a little bit more access to, you know, industry experts. Uh, and now it's, you know, I've got a Facebook group with over 1,800, 1,900 people in it to, uh, who really come together every three months to write a bunch of music and, and a Discord server. If you're a gamer, you might know what that is. It's a, you know, a chat server for people who like to play games, um, all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, and I started that as just a blog and coming out with resources like the that analysis of the Final Fantasy VII theme and, you know, giving more value through email and things like that and growing those social media accounts until now where it's like, you know, now I've got, because I've built it up over such a you know period of time that now I have a little bit more leverage to, you know, get interviews with people and to, uh, you know, get sort of these, these opportunities for people to, you know, get their questions answered directly by a composer uh, who's been doing this professionally for 15 years, who is not me, you know, that's, I'm not, I, I do, do not have any pretense of, I'm not a, a working composer. I have done a lot of work to understand the composition process and remove a lot of the mental roadblocks. And I am a, a teacher at heart, but, I, you know, so, but within the context of the website, I'm a teacher and a community leader and I like to make connections and I like to give people opportunities to get empowered. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been a crazy journey. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I've got right now 300 people, uh, we're in the middle of a 21 day challenge and, and, uh, the idea is just to write at least two to four bars of new music every day for 21 days to make it a habit. And, I've got 300 composers right now working through that and sharing their stuff online and giving each other positive feedback. And, and uh, you know, they're just getting used to the idea of putting their music out there, some of them for the first time. It's really fun and exciting. And, uh, and I hope that continues. Fantastic. Yeah, I've heard such good things from those on those challenges and in your members area about what you provide there. And I'm curious to know, was it all just easy for you, given you had the genuine passion and you had teaching experience? Was it, you know, a walk in the park to be like, now I'll write a tutorial on this game music and, well, now I'll put together a workshop on this. It, it, from my perspective, it's a very different student audience you have between online with adults versus in the classroom with a group of kids. Yes and no. You know, it's... It some of some of it's the same and some of it's different. Yes, adult learning, um, teaching adults. I, you know, I definitely, you know, the, there's this thing called imposter syndrome where you feel like you're not qualified to, and this is a very common thing. People feel like they're not qualified to do something that they are qualified to do. Um, and it's just like a perspective thing of, uh, you know, you just have to know more than the person you're teaching in order for, you know, you to be, uh, able to teach them something. Um, and, so, you know, I struggle with that sometimes because, again, I'm not a working composer, but I, as long as I'm transparent about that and I sort of stay in my lane of like, here are the things I'm good at, business, I'm good at, 
marketing and I'm good at, you know, the fundamentals of writing music and understanding what's going on in music, um, then I feel, I feel okay. Um, but it, you know, there's, there are parts that are tricky, like writing that, that, um, that, that article was fun, but it took a long time because I was sort of like a perfectionist about it at the time. But then after I was done writing the next one felt harder because I had, you know, it's like, well, it has to be at least that big or bigger. Otherwise, what am I doing? And so, you know, I, I have things like that, you know, there, there are stupid human things that get in the way, just like with anything. Um, but parts of it are easier for me. I'm, you know, again, really into the marketing stuff. So I, you know, wasn't, you know, I, if I want to spend some time really upping the ante on my social media stuff, I know how to do that. If I, I don't need help putting together a website that talks to another program that runs my email newsletter that talks to another program that handles my credit card processing. I don't need anyone to help me do that because I know how to do all that stuff just because I nerded out on that stuff for years, you know, in my, my free time. Um, which is obviously a really cool thing to nerd out on. Um, but you know, uh, there are parts of it that are hard and there are parts of it that are easier. Me enjoying the music and me really being passionate about not just the music, but this community of like sort of underserved people, um, you know, professionally speaking anyways, that is something that is really exciting to me. And so that makes it a lot easier. I was trying to just do something because I saw a need, but I didn't really have an interest, then that would probably make it a lot harder. If you were running a show that wasn't about music and was about, you know, travel and you didn't like travel, it might be a lot harder for you to do these interviews because it would definitely be a lot harder, right? Because it's not something you're interested in talking about every day, but you got to really, you got to have the interest. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to handle the, the challenges and the lack of motivation times, which happen to everyone. So. Cool. Well, I know firsthand how challenging effective online education and nurturing a really friendly, supportive community can be. So I just wholeheartedly applaud you for what you've been able to do with VGM Academy so far. And I, I feel like we've kind of mentioned a few things, but I'd love if you could just give a more full rundown of what's on offer at vgmacademy.com, um, both your free stuff and your paid stuff. Sure. Yeah. So they... The main things I would say people should look into is if you have any interest in writing music, um, you know, I would say start by writing and just like kind of getting in the mix with this challenge, which is like a very low pressure writing. You know, literally, if you want to scratch like a few bars of music on a napkin at lunchtime, like that counts, like literally just getting music out of your head and on the paper or in a computer this challenge, 21 days of VGM that we do. If you go to vgmacademy.com slash 21 days, you can opt in. We're in the middle, we're like a week into the challenge right now, but you can still jump in late, no big deal, um, or sign up for the next one. And that's a really cool place to get started with writing if you want to actually put pen to paper or digital pen to digital paper. Um, aside from that, we have a membership community, which we call the Members Network, and you can get there. Uh, if you go to vgmacademy.com, there's a link there or you can go to members.vgmacademy.com and it'll bounce you over. And in there is, uh, you know, a little bit more access to me for getting feedback, uh, a little bit more focused community about getting feedback on compositions. We do biweekly, uh, we call them round tables, where we get on a Zoom call, which is a video call with a bunch of people. Um, and we listen to four members tracks and we give feedback live. And it's really useful for people who have hit a, stumbling block or they really want to know how they can, you know, affect this one thing a little bit differently or improve the mix and their music. And it's nice because it's not just me. You get the, the, you know, the access of the whole community's knowledge, which is great. Um, but then we also monthly do a, an industry expert Q and a where we bring in someone like Austin Wintry or Grant Kirkhope, like I mentioned earlier. And these are like big names in the industry, but they take an, you know, they come in for an hour, hour and a half and they answer questions um, that are from, not from me, but from members. So I take all the member questions and I organize them and then I, I pose the questions, but they're not my questions at all. They're all from members. Um, so those are the big things. There's some course content in there about writing melodies, which obviously I'm passionate about if you've been listening, uh, so far here and, um, you know, uh, some other stuff I'm starting to put out some networking courses and marketing courses. I'm starting to build those out, uh, within that membership community. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I try to just make it a good community. There's, like I said that earlier, there's a private Facebook group. If you go and request access and promise to not be 
you know, a jerk face, I'll let you in. And, um, and that's a great place. It's just no spam, no self-promotion. You can go in there and ask questions and get help and not get, you know, bombarded with people saying, listen to my track, listen to my track, listen to my track. Um, you know, the Twitter, the Twitter uh, account is very active. The Instagram, Instagram account is, is pretty active right now. Um, so if you want to connect with other people, join this challenge, join the membership community. If you'd like to jump in the private Facebook group, it's all fun places to meet people. And we're all, I mean, everyone's really super supportive and really super kind. So that's the kind of nice thing about the gaming industry. There's not really a lot of like elitism that you might like run into in classical music where there's sort of this, you know, exclusivity, uh, people in the gaming industry seem to be really, uh, open, you know, great people with open arms, which is awesome. So if you know nothing, show up, you're just as welcome as someone who's been doing it for 10 years. Terrific. And I feel like that gives some really great pointers for anyone who's curious about composing video game music. And I wonder if we could make some suggestions for those who aren't really thinking in that direction, but are super curious having heard this conversation about video game music in general. I think <laughs> you kindly did an interview for us at easyeartraining.com a few years back and I, uh, I ended with the mean question of whether Mario or Sonic had better music. I won't ask you that, but I would love if you could run down a few of your favorite soundtracks maybe or some recommendations you'd have for listeners or viewers of this show who are just like, oh, I wonder what video game music's like given that it has great melodies and it's not the kind of 8-bit chiptune stuff we, we used to know. Yeah, so I don't remember what I said, but but my answer today would be Mario. But um, let's see. So there's I've got some interesting, you know, answers. I think that soundtrack to Journey, if you like orchestral music, that is you know very, um, you know, very beautiful and and uh, very sort of like transient sounding. Um, I think that the the soundtrack to Journey by Austin Wintry is a fantastic listen for. Anyone who likes, you know, melodic focused, uh, you know, or instrumental music. Um, if you want to get a little bit more specific, this is a fun one that I like a lot. Uh, there's a, a, a group called, I think they're called, Gen yeah, they're called Gentle Love. And they, they release uh, lullaby versions uh, with really good, almost jazzy piano and saxophone arrangements. And they're fantastic players. It's just this, these two people, a saxophone player and a, and a piano player. And they release these beautiful lullaby versions of, uh, you know, really retro game music. So, you know, when my, I have two sons, uh, you know, one of them's four, but when he was, you know, a little baby, he was constantly getting rocked to sleep to this, you know, beautiful saxophone music that was, from Final Fantasy games that I played as a kid. And it's just sort of a really interesting um, interesting window to see that music here being so beautifully played and having it be so beautifully arranged. You know, a lot of those loops are like a minute long, but they are, you know, they've been grown into these, you know, two to six minute arrangements. Um, that's a really fun one. Um, and the, the uh, Gentle Love, they, the series is called Prescription for Sleep. Those are the, the albums, there's like six or seven albums now of video game music arranged as piano and saxophone lullabies. Um, yeah, uh, there's just so much good stuff out there, you know? I'd say um, it's tough. You, you, it's still tough. I mean, you know, Final Fantasy is always a sweet spot for me. Uh, it's what I grew up on. I actually sang on the soundtrack for Final Fantasy 15, which is like a globally released, uh, you know, AAA uh, video game. Um, so I, the music for that's really cool. Um, really big orchestra, like, you know, you're fighting the big scary monster stuff. And like, you know, at the same time you could, you know, the next track might be like, you're sitting at a, you know, a shack on the, you know, seaside village. So there's like a lot of variety within there. Um, and uh, I'd say those are some good places. Journey, uh, Prescription for Sleep. It's on, available on iTunes through the Materia Collective label. And, uh, and the, uh, soundtrack to Final Fantasy 15. Terrific. Thank you. Well, we'll have links to all of those as well as to videogamemusicacademy.com and your social media and so on in the show notes for this episode. Huge thank you, Dan. It's been just as much fun as I knew it would be to get to talk with you and nerd out on some of this stuff. And just, yeah, huge thank you and keep up the good work because I think 
I'm sorry to say I feel like it's still an underserved area apart from videogamemusicacademy.com which just highlights the importance of the work you're doing for that industry and for those who are aspiring to be part of it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll keep trying to serve them. But you're right, it's still still an underserved community and, and uh, you know, I can always be doing more and, and I'll keep tra- striving to do that myself. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out. And it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.